ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ನಮೋ ಭಗವತೆ ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ today we're reading from shrimad bhagavatam canto 10 chapter 60 text 40 the title of the chapter is krishna teases rukmini jadyam vachastava gagra jadyastu bhupan vidravya sanga ninadena jahartamam tvam We'll start over. Jadyam vachastava gadagra jayastu bhupan Vridhavya sanga ninadena jaharta mam tvam Simho yatha svabali isha pashum svabagam Tebhyo bhyadyat udatim sharanam prapana Jadyam vachastava gadakraja yastu bhupan Vridravya sanga ninadena jahartamam tvam Simho yatha svabalim isha pashum svabagam Tebhyo bhyadyat udadhim sharanam prapana Jadyam vachasta vagadakraja yastu bhavabhupan Vridravya sharnga ninadena jaharta mam tvam Simho yatha svabalim isha pashum svabagam Tevyo bhyadyat udhadim sharanam prapana Matajis.
Jadya. Jadyam. Foolishness. Vachaha. Words. Tava. Your. Gadagraja. O Gadagraj. Yaha. Who? To. Even. Bhupan. The kings. Vridravya. Driving away. Sharnga. Of Sharnga. Your bow. Ninadena. By the resounding. Jahartha. Took away. Mam. Me. Twam. You. Singha. A lion. Yatha. As. Sva. Your own. Balim. Tribute. Isha. O Lord. Pashun. Animals. Svabhagam. His own share. Tebya. Of them. Bayat. Out of fear. Yat. That. Udadhim. Of the ocean. Sharanam prapanaha. Took shelter. Translation. My Lord, as a lion drives away lesser animals to claim his proper tribute, you drove off the assembled kings with the resounding twang of your sharnga bow and then claimed me your fair share. Thus it is sheer foolishness, my dear Gadagraj, for you to say you took shelter in the ocean out of fear of those kings. We can repeat together. My Lord, as a lion drives away lesser animals to claim his proper tribute, you drove off the assembled kings with the resounding twang of your sharnga bow and then claimed me your fair share. Thus it is sheer foolishness, my dear Gadagraj, for you to say you took shelter in the ocean out of fear of those kings. Purport. In text 12 of this chapter, Lord Krishna said, Rajabhyo Bibhyata Subru Samudram Sharanam Gatan. Terrified of those kings, we went to the ocean for shelter. According to the Acharyas, Lord Krishna finally provoked Rukmini's anger by glorifying other men who might have been her husband. And thus, in an agitated mood, she here tells him that she is not ignorant, but rather that he has spoken foolishly. She states, like a lion you abducted me in the presence of those kings and drove them away with your shanga bow. So it is simply foolish. Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prashtaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamini Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Paschatya Deshatarine Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhar Shivas Arigor Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Ram, Hare Ram, Ram Ram, Hare Hare. So this is a very significant sloka in this chapter. The chapter has 59 slokas. About 30% are spoken by Sukadev Goswami because he's setting the scene every time Krishna and Rukmini exchange their conversation. 
First he sets the scene, how beautiful the room is where they're seated. Then he sets the scene when Krishna decides to speak and convince Rukmini that she should divorce him and get a more suitable husband. Then Sukadev Goswami describes Rukmini's reaction to Krishna's words, how she faints, <laughs> falls to the ground, and then Krishna apologizes, explains that he was just trying to make her angry. He wanted to see her in an angry mood. Then Rukmini becomes cheerful, and now she's beginning to speak. She speaks in 15 slokas, and number 34 begins her speaking. Now we're up to 40. So 40 and 41, Rukmini has reached the peak of her anger as much as she can express to Krishna in her humble mood. So in this particular sloka, there are many important words. Uh, Rukmini, she's highly educated. She's Lakshmiji herself, who's eternally at the side of Narayan. And we remember that originally, at the very beginning of the 10th canto, it starts out when Bhumi Devi, she was so distressed by these very same kings that Krishna is trying to glorify in telling Rukmini she should marry. <laughs> Bhumi Devi goes to Brahmaloka and appeals to him that these kings they have no devotion to Krishna, to the cows, to the Brahmins. They sell the mantras. They sell the holy name of the Lord. I can't bear the weight of this burden. And the demigods supported her that, yes, we're also suffering. Brahma, you please do something. You're our protector in this universe. Brahma, he went to Lord Shiva. They both went to Narayan in Vaikuntha. Narayan was sitting with Lakshmi Devi and Saraswati. Narayan recommended at that time that you should go to Goloka and speak to my master and ask him to come and help you. So then they went to Yamaraj and asked him to come along because he's the he's Dharmaraj. And the three of them went to Goloka to approach the Supreme Lord Krishna. They had a beautiful darshan after crossing the Viraja River of Vrindavan, which is the dearmost of Krishna's planets upon which we are so fortunate to serve here in Vrindavan. And after entering many, many gates, they finally came to Radharani's palace where Krishna and Radharani were sitting together and they made their appeal, offering many beautiful prayers as we find in the Srimad Bhagavatam 10th canto. And Krishna agrees. He says, yes, I will come and I want you all to come with me. And at that time, he set a cast of characters because Brahma said, well, you want us to come, but what should we do when we go there? And Krishna, he told them that for instance, Lakshmiji, you will become Rukmini. You will take birth in the home of Bhishmaka from Vidarbi, his queen. And I will come to Kundina and I will marry you. Radha, you will go to the home of, Briha, of Brishabhanu and take birth. And we will be separated for 100 years because of a little argument that she and her brother Sudama, Sridham had, they cursed each other. Then he told all of the demigods that um, Indra, your Anksh will be Arjun, and Vayu, your Anksh will be Bhima, Yamaraj, your Anksh will be Yudhisthir, but you yourself will come as Vidura, Kali, your Anksh will be Duryodhan. Uh, and like that, he assigned each one of the demigods which parts they would play when Krishna comes to relieve the burden of Mother Earth. So now, Krishna is here playing his part. 
he immediately, because the Vasu, Kashyapa, Kashyapa, he took, he appeared as uh, partially Vasudev, and Aditi appeared as Devaki. And because Kashyapa, he had 13 wives who were the daughters of Daksha, uh, Vasudev also had 13 wives. Eight of them were all sisters, Devaki and her sisters. And we have in this sloka the name of Krishna, Gadagraja. So Gada, he was one of the younger brothers of Krishna. And he was born to one of the sisters of Devaki named Devarakshita. He was the younger brother because Agra, just like we have here Agra. So what does Agra mean? It means the first. Just as when Chaitanya Mahaprabhu first approached Mathura Mandala, the first forest that he entered was Agravan. That's the first forest. And that's the whole forest of Agra. So Agra means the first, and Ja means born. So Krishna's name is Gadagraj because he was born first before Gada his brother. Rukmini also called Krishna Gadagraj in this sloka because she was angry. She was frowning. Even she was pointing her finger at Krishna. In fact, the beginning, the first word of this sloka is Jadyam, foolish. Is she calling Krishna a fool? Like Jad Bada, Jad, lifeless. No, she's not that bold. <laughs> she's saying that your words, jadyam vachas tava, your words are foolish. Your words are lifeless. Because everything you've said to prove to me that I've, I'm foolish and I'm unintelligent and I made the wrong choice, I'm going to completely turn around and prove that your words are true because I made the right choice by marrying you. So Jadyam Vachastava Garagraj. Yes to Bhupan. Now who are these Bhupans, these kings? These are the exact same kings that Krishna came to destroy. We remember that when Krishna first came to Mathura and he killed his uncle Kamsa and his two widows returned very ingloriously to the home of their father, Jarasandha. They cried, they made such a scene. Our innocent husband, who was so great, such a great ruler, he was killed by his own nephew, Krishna. This enraged Jarasandha. Jarasandha came with 23 Akshohinis to destroy Krishna and Balaram. And at that time, Krishna and Balaram, who were still just little boys, about 12 years old. Suddenly from the sky, when they saw Jarasandha had completely surrounded Mathura with the Akshohinis, Krishna Balaram came out with just a small army and from the sky came two chariots filled with weapons. Now Krishna in his original form he has two hands. He carries a flute because here in Vrindavan, he's always enjoying. He doesn't need to have any weapons. Then when he goes to Mathura, he displays his forearms. Chakra, Padma, Shanka, and Gada. Now, he's going to have to fight 23 Akshohinis. So he arranges for more weapons to come, four more weapons. That means he's going to need eight arms. Now sometimes, most of the time, when Narayana appears in his, the different incarnations, he has four arms. But sometimes as a special darshan, just as with the prachetas, Krishna was very pleased, he appears with eight arms. And he has his four insignias that we always see in Narayan's hands. Plus he has these extra four weapons, and that is, the sangabo, his arrows in the quiver. 
he has a trident, and he has a snake. So these four additional weapons came in Krishna's chariot, and in Balaram's chariot came his club and his plow. So now they were ready to fight with Durasanda. So again, after Krishna has defeated 17 times, the 18th time he's going to set up his kingdom in Dwarka in the middle of the ocean, and he tries to convince Rukmini that it was out of fear. In sloka number 12, he says, terrified of these kings, O lovely browed one, Subru, we took shelter in the ocean. We have become enemies of powerful men and we practically abandon our royal throne. So Krishna is trying to convince Rukmini that he's a coward and he ran away from Jarasandha and he made this big kingdom in the middle of the ocean simply because he was terrified of all these powerful kings. Rukmini knew better. <laughs> she understood that these kings and in the coming slokas, she, she practically calls these kings asses, asses because they get kicked by their wives, uh, dogs, dogs because they're always trying to protect their property and their homes, cats because they eat the remnants of their wives, and he even calls them next, he calls them uh, asses, yes, A asses was first, uh, slaves, yes, they're slaves to their wives. So <laughs> Rukmini puts these kings in their proper place. And that's these bupans. So then she goes on to say, uh, Vidravya, driving away with your sharnga bow. Not, he didn't even have to pull his, he didn't have to shoot the arrows. He just twanged his bow and Fear went into the heart of all the warriors. So she was remembering, remembering what happened at the time of her Swayambara. When he came, he had his Sharanga bow there. And when all of the kings who were surrounding, they, they had all come because Shishupa was such a coward. They knew that he couldn't fight off Krishna. So they came to help their friend Shishupa. And they were waiting. As soon as they heard that Krishna and Balaram had arrived, everyone knew there was going to be a fight, but where it was going to be, when it was going to be, no one was sure. So Rukmini, she pre-planned all of this due to her foresight and her intelligence. We heard yesterday, don't come to the palace because then there might be bloodshed. You come at a time when I'm not protected, I'm all alone, and you can easily take me away. So what does she compare this to? Very nice example. Because we see here, we don't see so often now because of all the highways. But previously, 50 years, 100 years ago, even we saw this, we can sometimes see it when we're going to Govardhan, coming near to Rajasthan. You have the nomadic tribes. Some of them, they have their herds of cows, some of them have sheep, and some of them have goats, some of them have camels. They have no real residence, these farmers. They're not farmers either, they're nomads, they're tribes. And they wander from place to place, all over India, all over Asia and Europe actually. And um, they look for where the green grass is for their herds. And at night, because that's when the nocturnal animals, the predators come out, because no one can see them, at night the lions come. And there are dogs to protect the sheep and the goats and the cows, whoever they are, which an whichever animals. And they're men with their weapons. But when a lion comes, there's not much they can do because no one can defeat the lions. So the lion, he comes amongst the herd and he takes his bali, his offering. <laughs> the whole herd is offering one of the sheep, one of the goats, one of the cows. He takes it away, not much of a fight. 
So this is what Rukmini is comparing when Krishna took her away from these foolish bupans, these kings. They couldn't protect her. They had no power whatsoever. Just by twanging his bows, they became so frightened. Shishupal, he never even lifted a weapon. <laughs> they tried to fight on his behalf. He took off their heads, their arms, their legs, the elephants, the horses, all dying all along the path. Finally, they all gave up. They, they noticed, well, where's Shishupal? <laughs> Why are we fighting and where's he? So they all went home and Rukmi, the biggest fool of all of them, <laughs> he started to chase Krishna. And even after Krishna had completely humiliated Rukmini's brother, Rukmini never gave up her affection for Krishna. Second time, at the end of this chapter, we learn that Krishna, just as when he was benedicting the gopis at the end of the rasa dance, or at the rasa dance, he was saying, actually, I can never repay you for your devotion. You have to be happy with your own happiness of serving me. So Krishna, he gives, he gives that same benediction to Rukmini. And particularly, he gives that because he mentions that, yes, I disfigured your brother, and still you came with me to Dwarka, you married me, you never objected. But then, when we were marrying Aniruddha to Rukmini's granddaughter, grandson and granddaughter, and Balaram killed your brother, you never said a word. <laughs> you never even objected. And because of that silence, you purchased me. And therefore, I fulfill all of the benedictions that you have requested in Rukmini's 15 slokas. She doesn't ask to see the lotus face of the Lord. No, here, at the end of this sloka, she says, Sharnam Prapana. Now, we're familiar with this attitude of taking full shelter of the Supreme Lord. But no one aspires to take shelter of the Lord's face. The devotees, they're always aspiring for the shelter of the Lord's lotus feet. And Rukmini, she explains why. She says, I don't want to take shelter of your beautiful face because in your face is your mouth. And many times poison comes from that mouth. And she gives the example that, um, for instance, uh, Ram, he banished Sita. Krishna, he left the gopis to cry for the rest of their lives. So by his talking, uh, that talking can sometimes be like poison, although sometimes it can also be like nectar. So Rukmini, she says, I'm not interested in taking shelter of your lotus face. I want to take shelter of your lotus feet only and remain as your menial servant. Now this is Lakshmi Devi herself speaking. She is never separated from the Supreme Lord. She's always with Narayan, wherever she goes, wherever he goes. Now that's why, because from Srimati Radharani expands Lakshmi. From Lakshmi expands all of the Lakshmi Devis. For instance, the 16,108 wives that Krishna married. They were all expansions of Lakshmi, all Lakshmi Devis. So whenever Krishna comes to any of the planets in any form, Matsya, Korma, Nishinga Devi, anyone, Lakshmi Devi accompanies him. So therefore, in Rukmini's pure humility, she sees herself just like a mundane woman, as if she's taking birth. She's taking birth along with Narayan to accompany him as Lakshmi Devi but she considers herself to be just like an ordinary woman taking birth to serve her husband. And not only that, 
because another expansion of Lakshmi Devi, Rama, is Durga Devi herself. And when Narayan expands himself, lies down in the causal ocean, and wants to begin the creation of the mundane worlds in the Mahatattva, an expansion of Ramadevi as Durga appears before him and he merely glances at her. It's a glance of passion and that passionate glance agitates Durga Devi from which all of we living entities are created in material universes. So Rukmini Devi in her humility, she says, even your passionate glance when I expand in the form of Durga Devi, that I accept so gratefully. And she reminds Krishna that previously, this is chapter 53, the second sloka, she says, you're telling me that you have no affection for family life, for me, for any of your duties. No one can understand your real purpose of life but you admitted that you are thinking of me all the time and you can't even sleep at night. So I don't believe what you're saying now because you're contradicting yourself. So after that, she's taken shelter of Krishna's lotus feet. Why the feet? Because Krishna explains and all the other great saints such as Havi, one of the Nava Yogendras, he explains that the devotees are able to bind Krishna's lotus feet in their heart with their love and their affection. The devotees always keep Krishna's lotus feet. And the Lord is so merciful that he comes, he brings his lotus, with his lotus feet, he comes closer to the devotees to bring them closer to him. So the best shelter, this Sharanam Prapanna, is to take shelter of Krishna's lotus feet. Now, there was another incident later when everyone, when all of the three different camps of Krishna's associates, they joined together for the first time in Kurukshetra because we have just completed the wonderful Rathayatra. Krishna is now coming home to Lakshmi Devi in his palace in Jagannath Puri. So when all of the women were together for the first time in Kurukshetra, Draupadi, who was an, also an unks of Lakshmi Devi, she inquired from the principal queens that how were you able to get Krishna as your husband, Krishna the Supreme Lord? And the first person she asked, of course, was the chief queen, Rukmini. And Rukmini, she very humbly explains how Krishna kidnapped her by twanging his bow. This bow is very important. He uses this as one of his principal weapons when defeating the kings. Uh, she, he just had to twang his bow and he took me away from all of these kings. And then the other queens, they explained also. And the other, the other queens, in this description, these cast of characters that Krishna gives, he explains that uh, Jambavati, who is she, Shaibya, Mitravinda, he's telling each one of the gopis and the Lakshmis who they will be in his Leela when he appears as the Supreme Lord Krishna. For instance, um, Pradumna, we know that's Kamadev, and Rati, his wife, that's Mayavati and um, Kartikeya. Kartikeya is Shamba. That's the son of Jambavati. Now, how is that? Because in Ramlila, Jambavan, Jambavan was Himavan. That was the father of Himavati. He wanted to take part in Ramachandra's past times. So he appeared as Jambavan. And naturally, the daughter of 
Himavan would be Parvati. So Parvati, she was Jambavati, and Parvati's son is naturally Kartikeya. So in the additional Puranas, such as Brahma Vaivarta Purana, where all of this cast of characters is very explicitly explained by Krishna, he explains who's who. And you're all going to come and help me, and I'm going to take my millions of gopas and gopis, they'll all appear here in Vrindavan, and I want all of the demigods to appear as warrior princes, because when I have to fight these bupans, I want you all to assist me. So this is a drama. Krishna explains to Brahma, Shiva, Yamaraj, when they come to see him, he says that one moment in Goloka is equivalent to seven manvantars on the planet Earth. So Krishna's appearance here is just a drama. And he's bringing all of his devotees, all of his eternal associates along with him. And he's picking up the sadhana bhaktas at the same time so that they can prepare to go back to Godhead by taking part in his pastimes. Now Rukmini, who never leaves the side of the Supreme Lord, uh, she does not enter into the pastimes of Vrindavan. She remains in Dwarka with Krishna and then returns to the Vaikuntha planets as the eternal consort of Narayan. So here, as she is displaying her anger to Krishna, not directly calling him foolish, but implying that your words are foolish, you never actually, out of fear, took shelter of the ocean. And she refers to when, because the word here, this udak, so we have garb odak, Shai Vishnu, we have the first one is Karanadak. The word Uda is there. Uda means the ocean. Karanadak Shai Vishnu, Garvadak Shai Vishnu, Kirodak Shai Vishnu. So that Udak is there, the ocean. So she refers to when Krishna lies down in the ocean. And who are the real kings? that the Supreme Lord is fighting when he takes these manifestations of, as Vishnu lying in the three different oceans. She says, you are fighting the senses, the senses, the material senses that capture the devotees and keep them from surrendering unto you. You are fighting the three modes of material nature that keep your devotees or those aspiring to be devotees bound up in the gunas. So Krishna at one point when he was degrading himself to Rukmini, he said, I am gunahin. I don't have any real qualities. Nobody knows who I am, if I'm a cowherd boy, if I'm a kshatriya. So Rukmini later says that you are actually the reservoir of all qualities. And she then turns around all of the 11 slokas that Krishna denigrates himself in, and she praises Krishna with his exact same words. That is her superior intelligence. It's not an easy thing to even aspire to get Krishna as one's husband what to speak of actually becoming the chief wife of Krishna. She's the most intelligent. And therefore, she can take Krishna's words, turn them around, and at the same time glorify him and chastise him. <laughs> so later, Krishna is so pleased with her presentation. He calls her Sadhavi. And he also calls her Bhamini because she's Dakshina. She's the right hand of Krishna. In other words, she's very humble, submissive. She never argues with Krishna. She's always obedient. That's a Dakshin. Even their Dakshin gopis, such as Chandravali, they won't argue with Krishna. They'll always be submissive and humble to his demands. 
But the Bominis, they are the leftists. That's Radharani's group. They'll argue with Krishna. They'll order him around. They'll treat him as their servant. So he was glorifying Rukmini, calling her now Bamini. Yes, you did what I wanted you to do. You showed your anger. You pointed your finger at me. You looked at me with crooked eyes. This is what I was looking for. I missed this. You never showed that to me before. And this is what I was getting at. And then Krishna, he pretends to be an ordinary husband, as if he were joking with his own wife. But these jokes, these are on a completely transcendental platform. And this we have to remember. So Rukmini, now, there's been a change in Vrindavan since Srila Prabhupada first trained us how to live here. And I wanted to substantiate that in Rukmini's words. Now, when Prabhupada first had us come here to Vrindavan to establish this Vrindavan temple, he wanted everyone, brahmacharis, grihastas, vanaprastas, sannyasis, to live on the standard of Goswamis. And he set up very strict standards. He said that the grihastas cannot live together here. They have to live separately. And he made an example of one grihasta couple who were living in the guest house. He said, either you live separately or you must go. So they left. So none of us lived with our husbands at that time. We all lived separately because that was first class grihasta life. And uh, not only that, everything that we offered, everything that we had to cook, even in grihasta life, was brought to the deity's kitchen and was offered. So Prabhupada was teaching us very strict grihasta life here, not the kind of grihasta life that Rukmini speaks about. She says that only a rakshashi or a pichach paichachi, that means the daughter of a pichachi, <laughs> would choose anyone but you as a husband. So we in Krishna consciousness, trained by Prabhupada, our, our marriages were partnerships. We were partners in serving Srila Prabhupada and his mission. And we didn't behave like ordinary grihastas did. We read the Krishna book and we read how these foolish women accept their husbands who were just living corpses uh, to be their actual husbands. There's no real husband except for Krishna. And therefore, she calls these women fools, uh, duplicitous, unchaste, and one should never take shelter of an, one should never give shelter to an unchaste woman. So Prabhupada trained us in our Grihasta life to actually see our husbands as partners in serving our spiritual master, Srila Prabhupada. And we saw each other that way, when in good consciousness. At uh, one time, a devotee, I won't mention names, he sent a message to Prabhupada. Prabhupada was in Mayapur at the time. He sent a message to Prabhupada because they were living here. It, because this Garbadan Sanskara, Prabhupada insisted that everyone engage in Garbadan Sanskara if they were going to have a child. And part of the Garbadan Sanskara was that you had to announce and take the blessings of the Vaishnavas before you conceive a child. So this devotee in his innocence, he wanted to perform Garbadan Sanskari here in Vrindavan, and he sent a letter to Prabhupada asking for his blessings. When Prabhupada read the letter, he said, this is the greatest offense. He didn't allow us to even conceive in Vrindavan. That is how strict Srila Prabhupada was in keeping the Goswami mentality in our Vrindavan temple. He wanted the brahmacharis to be able to take shelter here, 
so that they would not be disturbed. He didn't want single women to be here. I'm telling you all of this because this is the chapter where Rukmini describes that our only real husband is Krishna. And anyone who thinks that their mundane husband is going to give them shelters is just befooled. They're just simply sec now, now another example, this sarnga bow. This sarnga bow represents time and how time defeats everyone. So Rukmini very explicitly in the coming slokas 45, 46, she explains that any foolish woman who takes shelter of a mundane husband, that husband, he will be completely exterminated by the power of time, Krishna's bow. So therefore, she shows Krishna that you're telling me to pick another husband amongst these kings, but I'm not such a fool as these women. These women, they can become the wives of these foolish kings. But I know who is the best person, and that is you, and I will only take shelter of you. So therefore, in our Krishna conscious life, we always have to remember who the Purusha is. We're all Prakriti. We're all the lovers of Krishna. No one should pretend to, in illusion, think that we have any other shelter in this material world other than the Supreme Lord Krishna. And Rukmini, in her exemplary intelligence and her harsh words to her beloved husband, proves to him that actually your words are foolish and my words are very intelligent because I will not take shelter of anyone but you, the Supreme Lord. I know you are the Supreme Lord. This is the difference between Vrindavan and Vaikuntha. I know who you are and I will never take shelter of anyone as a false protector in this material world. I will travel with you everywhere as your consort. No matter what form you take, I will always remain with you as your eternal consort. So Rukmini is displaying in her 15 slokas the topmost sharanam prapana. I will take shelter of no one but you. I've rejected my father. I've rejected my brother. I've rejected all the kings. I only take shelter of you, not even your lotus face. I only want to be your maidservant at your lotus feet. And all of the other queens, when they spoke to Draupadi, Gandhari, and the other women at Hastinapur, they only had the same prayer. Let me be a sweeper in one of Krishna's palaces. Let me take his foot dust. Let me be a simple maidservant as his wife. So our meditation, even in Vrindavan, should always be, Krishna is a supreme beloved. Krishna is our only protector. Krishna is our only husband. And all of our relationships that we have in this world, whether as wife, as husband, as mother, as father, these are our duties to our spiritual master. We have to perform our duties to the topmost perfection. In the mood of Goswamis, give all of our attachment and our affection to Krishna. When we love Krishna, we love everyone. So automatically we will love all of our family members, all of our friends, all of our relatives, because we love Krishna. We have to put things in the proper perspective, just as Rukmini is doing here. And see Krishna as our supreme protector. Okay, thank you very much. Any questions? Hare Krishna.
Yes, Mataji. just repeating the words that Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita man mana bhava mad bhakto mad yaji mam namaskaru so we're, we don't have any other message other than Krishna's message so sometimes when people come to us with their problems and they want solutions the real solution is as Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita uh, Sarva dharma paditya jaya mame kam saranam braja aham tvam sarva pape vyo moksha yashami masuchaha. We can only give the solutions that Krishna gives. Uh, they might want some other solution, but those solutions aren't given by Krishna. So you can apologize and say, well, if you don't like my, what I'm saying, which is in accordance with what Krishna says, then you can go to someone else for some advice, but I can't change what Krishna says. So therefore, anyone who comes, and many times we have to be counselors to devotees, they have problems, they're having fights, they're having uh, disagreements. We always have to give them the same answer as Krishna gives in Bhagavad Gita. You take shelter, both parties, take shelter of Krishna, and then all of your arguments, all of your disagreements will evaporate. So that's the real solution to all the problems in the world, to take shelter of Krishna. We shouldn't be embarrassed. We shouldn't compromise. Okay. All right, no more questions. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Jai.